The market master of the day is S. Narain, Executive Director and Chief Investment Officer at uh, ICICI Prudential Asset Management Company. Uh, if I dare say, one of the best-known contrarians uh, in the market, uh, someone who uh, puts his money where his mouth is. He's been telling us, I mean, I, uh, Narain, we spoke earlier in the year, at the start of the year, uh, almost, and at that point, you were uh, pretty cautious. Uh, you were still of the view, which you carried on from 2000, late 2022, uh, that uh, there is more, perhaps more pain to go. Uh, you were sort of advocating allocation to debt schemes, uh, to debt as an asset class, basically. Uh, how are things looking now? I mean, your view has worked out pretty well. Uh, how, is, how are things looking now? Is a lot of the froth out of the system? And how much more downside, according to you? See, at 17,000, valuations are much more reasonable. And uh, the global uh, e macro people are just too short on uh, everything. And uh, we have a Fed meeting today. And uh, it is possible that there can be a good relief rally. If all the shots in the system have to be taken out, there can be a very good relief rally. Does it mean that you can have very big returns in equity from here? The answer is no at this point of time. But uh, is the market tactically well poised at this point of time? Certainly, uh, uh, because the global funds have just turned too negative at this point of time without reason uh, because uh, they had to go short somewhere and they found India a good place to go short. So I think tactically we are very well positioned, uh, but at the same time we don't believe in very big market rallies. Okay, Naren. Uh, well, I guess uh, some of that caution and a bit of a reality check is, is very good to always uh, have on board. Uh, I want to talk to you specifically about India. I mean, we'll wait to see what the Fed does and we'll see what's happening to those Western banks. Uh, but with respect to the market here in India, I guess the good thing for investors is that now valuations have cooled off. We're no longer trading one, two standard deviations above our mean as we usually do. Uh, so in that context, uh, you know, wh which part of the market looks most attractive to you where perhaps, uh, you know, you would be happy to deploy fresh money as well? See, clearly uh, there are areas like banks, for example, which are uh, much more reasonably valued at this point of time. The problem with banks at this point of time is every one of the domestic funds and every one of the global funds has uh, roughly 25-30% in banks. So if there is a redemption, people have to sell 25-30% to 30 banks. So till you see good inflows, banks don't perform, not because it is attractive and unattractive, but because it is a big holding in every fund. So I would say banking is certainly something which is attractive. Uh, certainly if you look at it, auto is attractive because uh, of all the consumer discretionary stocks, this is one of the sectors where in the last 10 years there has been very low growth. So people don't put implied growth assumptions which are ridiculously high. For the last six years, two-wheeler industry hasn't grown or passenger vehicle industry hasn't grown. People don't put implied assumptions which are very, very high. So that makes the industry much more uh, reasonably valued compared to many of the other consumer discretionary industries. Uh, so clearly, you know, telecom is a sector where there is still scope for over a la next two to three year period for ARPUs to grow from here. So these are some of the sectors where there is uh, upside potential. The way technology has been tanking, uh, clearly, that is another sector where there is scope for uh, re-rating over a longer term period. Pharma as a sector has done extremely badly and again it is a sector where there is scope for returns over the medium term. So there are uh, multiple sectors where as you can see over the last 18 months to 24 months valuations have corrected. And, uh, you know, uh, if we get uh, many uh, new age stocks also very, very cheap in some of the NFOs, IPOs, if they were to happen, even mm -hmm. they can be considered because they are no longer, no one is talking about uh, multi illogical valuations. So if they come at uh, very low valuations, even, even we look at some of the new age companies also. All right. Uh, hi, Mr. Narain. Always good hearing your thoughts, sir. Uh, Nigel, on this side, I want to focus on two sectors that you just spoke about. One was on the banks. The PSU banking theme worked out very, very well last year. And I think you were in the camp that was quite positive on that space. Do you believe it still offers value? And on the telecom space, 
you know, the ARPUs are likely to move up and you've been positive on that space as well. What kind of hikes are you factoring in for this year? See, everything that we decide, like for example, if you take telecom, it's not something that the ARPUs need to go up this year. It, it will go up over the next two to three years. Will it go up in the next six months? We don't know. It may go up, but uh, will it go up in the next two to three years? Certainly. I okay. mean, when can you, you can't actually exactly time. This is exactly like PSU's uh, two years back. In mm. 2020, October, most people said PSUs will never deliver return. Could we have predicted when PSUs will deliver return? It is something like that. You can't predict when the ARPUs will go up. Aren't Indian ARPUs very low compared to the world? The answer is yes. Will they go up? They will go up. Can we predict the mm. timing? The answer is no. So that's as far as telecom is concerned. Banks have seen a first round uh, rally and they are no longer as cheap as what they were. I think uh, next, uh, you know, if there are no big credit events over the next two years, they can re-rate. But uh, the, uh, no longer are some of the banks as cheap, PSU banks as cheap as they were. They have corrected in the last three months. Uh, so that gives you scope for some near-term rallies. But uh, for the banks to perform, we should not have credit events. And uh, that is a challenge actually in uh, bank, uh, PSU banks at this point of time. Because uh, a year back or a year and a half back, they were priced as though they, they will never grow. They will never be able to create uh, profits. Today, they are sitting on record profits. So from here on, mm. you don't need profits to grow as much as to have that profit should not go down before because of any credit events. Uh, just a quick point on valuations, right? Uh, you know, yesterday we had Sanjay Mukim of JP Morgan uh, and uh, we were talking to him. He said the problem is that there is no there is no historical valuation because valuations have only gone up over the last 10, 15 years. I mean, it's like an upward sloping sharp curve from where we were at 12, uh, 13. Uh, you know, multiples have gone up very sharply. So when you say we are at 17 times now, 10 year average is 17 times. Uh, just to, uh, just trying to understand how you think about these uh, these valuations. What do you consider uh, a fair kind of uh, multiple to look at? Yeah, actually, uh, that's where, you know, I have trouble uh, telling investors, you know, uh, 2008 to 2021, you had uh, printing presses in Washington and uh, Brussels. Even now, printing presses are on in Tokyo. So you have to look at valuations in the next five years. Uh, uh, you have to take a call whether the printing presses in Washington and Brussels will again reopen or not. If the printing presses in Washington and Brussels will not reopen, you can't put the last 10 years valuations all the time because at that point of time, you got zero in debt. And because you got zero in debt, people invested in equity. So should you use the last 10 years valuations or not? That's why when I tell investors yeah, you can't get 15% per annum easily in equity, people start looking at me as though I'm a bear. I'm not a bear, but I'm a believer in more moderate equity returns because you don't have printing presses operating in Washington and Brussels. If mm -hmm. Due to all the global events, if to, tonight if Fed comes and says, I'm going to start quantitative easing, then mm -hmm. I'll change my view and say, we are going to get much better returns in equity than debt. But mm -hmm. if Fed continues to say inflation is a source of worry, I am not going to print money, then you are still in a moderate return world. You are not in a high return equity world because 2008 to 21 was backed by record printing in Washington and uh, Brussels. And every Indian corporate which was credit worthy could get money in global markets at less than 1%. Today, when, to, when they want to borrow in global markets, they have to pay 5 to 6%. That's a big change. And that, mm -hmm. that change, uh, people don't want to understand. And that is why big returns in equity market require much lower interest rates in the Western world. And that's such a uh, beautifully put, Narin, and such an important point. Uh, so what is the framework you are uh, using right now? I mean, of course, when the facts change, as you said, you'll change your mind. If uh, QE starts again, you change your mind. Uh, but uh, I remember that in our last interaction, you said that, uh, you know, it's, uh, macros are going to be very important in the next decade. So I'm assuming you have a view in terms of how you're thinking about this. Will interest rates remain uh, relatively higher for some time to come? 
See, that we don't know. That depends on the Fed. But what we told mm. as the outlook for the year is uh, SIPs, uh, STPs, booster STPs, asset allocation, multi-asset funds, fixed income. This is what we said. After the market fall, we are saying there is a lower downside in equity than before, certainly. And that's the reason we called it uh, multi-asset as the most important asset class. And look at what happened to gold recently. And uh, it is not that gold is attractive at $2,000. We don't think gold is attractive at $2,000. But uh, we believe multi-assets is the way to go because, you know, at one point of time, gold protected portfolios. At some other point of time, debt will protect portfolios. At another point of time, equity will protect portfolios. But we are not in a high return world till the day Fed starts QE or till the day Fed starts saying interest rates will come down to 3%, we'll bring down interest rates sharply. Till that point of time, we are in a moderate return world and we are not in a high return world. And that's why we have been very, very focused on asset allocation. We have been focused on categories like balanced advantage, but at the same time, what we think is, you know, value has done extremely well. We think growth and innovation is also something which we have to look forward. And that is something we are thinking about at this point of time. I take your point, Narain. And I, value is uh, the area that I really wanted to come to because you are the original contrarian of the street, right? I remember coming to your office so many years ago and you were looking at a lot of these power stocks which nobody wanted to touch in the market at that point in time. Uh, which brings me now to my question. This whole trade that's been ongoing, both on power as well as capital goods, it's been a, almost a sort of a you know, one-way move over the last couple of months. Is this getting uh, a crowded, fashionable trade? Uh, how should uh, you know, medium-term investors look at it? How do we look at multiples for a stock like NTPC, for instance, which has r rallied a lot, but it's uh, nowhere close to its 2008 highs? See, you, uh, you, we can't talk on stocks, but the moment uh, stocks start trading at 15 times price to earnings and 20 times price to earnings, then we start getting worried. If they start trading at two times book, then we start getting worried. So like what happened to some of the new age companies, they were all trading only on sales basis. So till the time stocks trade at uh, two times book and three times book, we are very far away from them at this point of time in sectors like power. Capital goods sectors are trading at high valuation, but the stocks are so illiquid that barring one or two companies, the other companies, you can't even buy $200 million or 1,000 crores worth of stocks for a big mutual fund like us. So that's mm -hmm. the difference between when I was running infrastructure fund between 2004 and seven, and now that there are hardly any capital goods stocks with liquidity at this point of time. Okay, so then how, how, let me just follow that up with... Uh, you know, a question on this whole capex move that we are talking about. Government capex is a reality. We see that in numbers. Then, then how do you look to play it? Uh, is defence an area that you would consider? And are you at all looking to poise your portfolios for a pickup in the private capex cycle? See, there is no doubt that you know between capex and consumer discretionary, capex is a much better way to play it. But CapEx is not an easy way for stock picking. What stocks do you buy? That's one of the reasons, you know, banks appear as a much better way to play the CapEx cycle. As in, But uh, the, for banks to deliver returns, you need good inflows into markets, a much more positive macro environment in the world. But banks are the best way to play the CapEx cycle because at least you're able to buy billions of dollars worth of stocks for any fund manager in the world. So I think uh, in this part of the cycle, whether it is banks, it is cement, yeah, at some point of time it would be metals. These are the sectors that you would have to play for the CapEx cycle because the capital goods stocks are not liquid enough for a large fund, fund like ICICI to be able to buy because there are hardly one or two stocks in the capital goods space where we can put a billion dollars to work. All right. Uh, Narain, what about the real estate space? Everyone was talking about, you know, we're in the initial two, three good years and then we have a longer run out here. Yeah? Interest rates have gone up. Are you in the camp that believes that real estate will do well uh, from year on? See, as a structural multi decade opportunity, it remains. But uh, right now, uh, you know, after the good move uh, in interest rates, you know, it becomes difficult uh, and, you know, the recent uh, way in which, you know, some of the IT companies cut salaries, you know, 
I am a bit confused right now whether to bet on the long term structural story in uh, real estate or to look at the tactical part that uh, you have had a big increase in interest rates and uh, a drop in uh, salaries and the fact that some of the IT companies have even cut headcount. So which of the two to take, I am a bit uh, not clear. So I would say we are somewhere in the middle on real estate. But if a person wants to invest and uh, not look at the share for the next decade, maybe I think it's an interesting sector to look at. Mm. Uh, Narin, uh, how does, uh, you, so you briefly mentioned even new age companies, right? Uh, which, uh, which, which may look attractive. Are they already looking attractive in many cases? And uh, can you uh, tell us which, which are the ones which, because it's a bombed out space. Uh, which are the ones which are looking attractive uh, to you, to your team? See, I think, no, very few have got listed. And I think in the next few years, many more will have to get listed. I'm hoping that the uh, private equity and venture capital funds which own them, they will come at a good valuation because uh, they've realized uh, that there is no way they'll be able to come at absurd valuations and the global environment for growth stocks is not what it was in 2021. And uh, many of the private equity firms do need exits at this point of time. So I'm hoping that they will come at attractive valuation. The number of uh, new age companies which are listed at this point of time are very few and many of them have already made corporate governance mistakes. Suddenly, one of these companies says, I want to buy another company. And uh, these kind of things, they don't seem to know that once you're a listed company, you're answerable to all kinds of shareholders and you have to behave as a good corporate citizen. They have to learn from some of the older companies which are listed in India. Uh, so there's a lot they need to learn. And I believe that that's a very interesting space for us. I must thank the first few listed companies in India for making mistakes because otherwise we were very worried that they will come at absurd valuations. There has been a good fall in valuations of some of the first companies which got listed, which means that the following companies will have to come at much better valuations for the benefit of the mutual fund investors. So uh, let me just uh, you know dig a little deeper on, on that point, Narain. When the first lot came in, as you said, it was all about uh, price to sales. There's no idea of profits. We were just looking at valuing on whatever the number of subscribers of the sales are. Uh, as a money manager now, uh, would, let's say, earnings still be your first lens or your first filter? Would you expect that from the new lot? Uh, as someone who's deploying money, what are you looking for uh, as you look to buy some of these new age businesses? See, we have to look at whether they have created a good entry barrier, whether that uh, market is capable of growing, whether there is a way in which they are going to make good money two years from now. You know, there was a point of time, you know, when we looked at some of the, even some of the private bank in 90s, uh, they used to trade at, uh, the best private banks in 90s used to trade at 10 price to book and I, we used to ask, is it worthwhile? But, you know, over a period, point of time, they all grew. So, you know, we have to do much more growth-oriented thinking. I have left it to some of my colleagues to actually do that thinking and come to a conclusion that some of these companies will grow. They have created moats which are not easy to actually replicate. And uh, if they have good management teams and uh, ability to actually run the business as well, and they also know how to manage capital allocation. Because uh, it is, uh, these are all young companies run by, run by young founders who don't have experience of managing public uh, listed companies. So there's a lot of challenge there, but it's very interesting actually. And uh, the way these stocks have derated is very, makes it much more interesting at this point of time than what it was in 2021 when they, all they sold was stories. And at that mm -hmm. point of time, we used to be much more worried about them than where we are in 23 uh, March. Mm. All right, Narin, final question then uh, from my end. Uh, you know, we had a very good budget, focus on CAPEX as well as infra. However, the rural economy is in a bit of pain. Now we're talking about unseasonal rains as well. Do you think, uh, you know, the government's bandwidth or the resources, attention could shift from the CAPEX to the rural economy, which in turn will not be very comforting from an equity market perspective? Uh, your sense on that? Is that a risk? 
I don't think, you know, I think anything which benefits the K-shaped uh, K-shaped recovery has been there. And if any rec anything that the government does to help the bottom thousand million people in India will be viewed as positive for the market because it helps the entire consumer staple sector, it helps the telecom sector, it helps the healthcare sector, it helps even sectors like cement. So I don't think uh, if you believe that uh, helping the rural sector is going to hurt the Indian equity market, far from it. I think we need the thousand million people to actually grow as fast as the top hundred million people. And that's what I'm sure that the government is interested in. And without that, I don't think uh, we are going to have a very good growth story for the next 10 years. So I think any support that the government does to help the rural people and uh, anyone in distress will be seen as very positive for the markets in a medium term basis. And I'm sure they'll find the resources for it because look at the kind of improvements that have been seen in the computerization of taxation, GST, etc. And that's the reason for a superb increase in tax collections in India. And as that keeps on improving, I think that resources will be found and that's needed to help the rural sector and anyone in distress at all points of time. Narayan, as we come down to last thoughts, uh, you know, let me ask you a question. We would never ask, uh, you know, someone like you about where the market is going, but allow me that this one time because this has been a very interesting year. We started off with India underperforming, then we had an Adani event, then we had these foreign banks blowing up, then we had, uh, you know, runaway rates uh, and sticky inflation. As you're looking at the rest of 2023. Uh, what's the best case scenario for this market? Uh, I mean, maybe a time correction, maybe just a year of no returns, or can it actually be uh, more optimistic and better than that? Yeah, actually, sitting in a mutual fund, we think this is a year to actually invest for the long term without looking at what happens to the market in 2023. We think, you know, compared to 2021, September, to March 2023, we think that 2023 March to 2023 December is a period to invest in to reap returns in 2025 and 26. What happens to the market in 2023 is a question that you should ask what happens in Fed. You should ask Jerome Powell at midnight today because I think he's a better judge of what will happen to the markets this year. But that's not our goal. <laughs> Our goal is to generate long-term returns for our investors. And for that, this year is a better accumulation time than 2021 or 22 for that matter. All right. Uh, there you have it. Uh, you know what, you, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Narin, uh, it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure speaking with you. Uh, great conversation as always and uh, very, very uh, sort of balanced commentary. Very useful for our viewers. Thank you so much uh, for your time here on uh, CNBC TV 18. One of the most uh, candid, straightforward uh, investors, a complete contrarian, uh, has uh, sort of done this a long time and outperformed the market a long time as well. S. Narain, CIO, ICICI Prudential, AMC. We'll take a very quick break here. The market's up about 55 odd points or so at 17.161. Uh, we are back with the management of Century Ply Boards. We'll talk uh, to them about their business outlook. Later, we'll connect with uh, the management of Anupam Rasayan to discuss their demand and business outlook. Stay tuned.